And actually, your point a bit earlier um, about the addiction research and how nicotine could potentially be used to treat addiction and um, more drug addictions, etc. So that actually comes on to that brings me on nicely to my next question, which was in terms of the different areas of research. Um, if you were to prioritise one or two different areas in the next five to 10 years, which you think would, would be the most impactful in terms of mental health and nicotine in this whole area, what do you think would be the most important or the most significant? Or have, what would have the most impact um, for people? Oh, gosh, that's such a tough question because there's yeah. so many. Because, you know, uh, this is my thinking. It's not, I'm not saying this is exactly the way it is, but but over yeah. my career and my talking with people and researching, I've really come to the belief that addiction has shockingly little to do with the actual substance being used, right? That um, people don't start using, or I should say people don't start abusing drugs because they are addicted to them. They start abusing drugs for other reasons. And that usually has a lot to do with their mental health, their physical circumstances, their environmental circumstances, what's happening around their financial circumstances. Really, mental health is at and should have always been at the forefront of the conversation about drug use and drug abuse in particular. Whereas, you know, mental health issues are often the leading cause of substance abuse, really. And yes, what you choose to use if you're going to abuse drugs does have meaningful impacts. Uh, you know, if you're going to use, let's say, fentanyl-laced opioids off the street versus um, abusing alcohol, which you can purchase legally at a store and kind of, you know, have a pretty good guarantee that it's not adulterated with any kind of toxin. Um, but no, yeah, I, I would really love to see more research and particularly, I would love to see more research on the role of self-efficacy in mental health and addiction and particularly with nicotine, because I think in the, um, in our passion to communicate to the public, the dangers of smoking and to encourage people not to take up smoking or to quit smoking and give them help to quit smoking, we have really stigmatized the smoker and now we're doing the same to the nicotine user, the person who uses nicotine or the person who smokes. I should be very clear, we shouldn't call them users. They are people who also happen to use these substances. Uh, and that, from some of the research I've seen, particularly with already marginalized people, whether that's a person of color in America, someone who has low income, someone who has uh, mental health stigma, stigma perhaps, they are you know, their mental relationship with smoking and drug use is very complex. And it's not the way we would think normally when it comes to stigma. Sometimes stigma actually, you know, if you look at, for example, mothers of color who are smokers and they ask them in interviews, you know, in, in research, like, what do you think when you see statements like, you know, you're harming your children with your smoking or, you know, you're going to die and you're a bad person. And they internalize this. They, they truly do feel that but it only makes them want to smoke more because they feel worse about themselves. They feel they, they have less control. They feel like a worse person. And that's a mental health problem that I think the public health community, and there has been some discussion to, you know, to the health community's credit, but I don't think enough people have really thoughtfully asked, how do we balance this interest in encouraging the public to take safer, you know, to make safer choices? whether that's quit smoking or switch to a non-combustible, how do we do that and balance concerns with stigma? Because we know that when you put stigma on a person, all the negative consequences that that can have for their health. Uh, and I just, just don't think that's been talked about enough because you're so concerned about keeping kids away from smoking, getting adults to quit. they are not thinking about how are these tactics affecting public health? Like separate from how they are working in terms of getting people to quit smoking, what is the overall public health effect on mental health from these campaigns? Oh. I think it becomes a lot like um, paying telephone um, where, you know, information gets handed down by the government um, to different groups and organizations. And, you know, a lo lot of it is also religious, religion based where it doesn't fit into that religious group um, or, or that belief system. And it gets degraded to such a point where it does become the stigma and children are then forced to hide the things that are stigmatized um, and it becomes harder to talk about and creates almost a generational gap of discussions that aren't being held because of um, opinions that are, are made from fact and are not deducted from evidence um, and not made publicly available because the, 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 the biases of you know uh, translating that information um, make it very difficult for there to be a clear cut answer to all of this. Yeah, and we see that all the time in public health where there is a complex answer 
to a, what seems like a simple question. And public health authorities generally choose to go with the simple answer because they don't want to confuse the public into making bad choices. For example, you know, we say that, uh, and this is not necessarily my, my super area of expertise, but, you know, we tell women who are pregnant in America anyway not to drink at all. Or even if you think you're going to get pregnant, there's a chance you could become pregnant. You shouldn't drink any alcohol at any point in time, even while our public health authorities know that the risks of one glass of wine at dinner, if you're in a specific trimester, is basically not very risky. That is a complex message to communicate to the public that public health often doesn't want to do because they're worried some people will hear that as permission to just go bananas and, you know, drink an entire handle of whiskey or something like that, even though I, I, I have more faith in the public's ability to understand some of this technical information if communicated correctly. But And, and I think, Ilna, you really hit on an important thing, and it's something I've been saying since the beginning of the panic over youth vaping, which is that, and this, this is true of every drug panic that when you have that much attention on the issue and it is such a hot button topic and you then start this campaign of stigma and in uh, this campaign of trying to force youth or any age group to behave a specific way, it does. It results in people feeling, you know, they recognize that this isn't the socially acceptable behavior or acceptable by my parents, so I'm going to hide it. And then they hide everything that, go everything that went into the decision to use that drug whether it's nicotine or something else, and then the effects in the aftermath, like when they actually maybe do have a problem with a substance, with a substance use issue, and they want help, that is such a hurdle for a young person to then admit that to any adult when they know the response they're going to get is, I told you, that's such a stupid choice, blah, blah, blah. You know, when I, I know when I was younger, for example, I have a pretty severe case of ADHD, which is why I lost my train of thought earlier. I had a little bit of tiny little distraction. I completely lost my train of thought. But I, you know, I, well, whenever that started, I'm born with it, started young. Uh, I didn't know I had ADHD until I was practically in my 20s, but I knew I wanted to smoke by the, by the time I was 13. And I can't tell you why, if that had any connection to it, but I didn't start smoking until I was about 19 or 20, like right around the age uh, where it was legal where I was living. Uh, and for me, and I don't smoke anymore, and yay, thanks to alternative non-combustible products. But for me, it has a fairly moderate, it's a, a way for me to take care of myself. If I feel I didn't get a lot of sleep, I'm particularly distracted, I'm having a hard time. It is a way, it is an additive, it is a, in, a conjunctive therapy, you might call it, on top of the you know prescribed medications that I might take. And I think that's true of a lot of young people, right? So if a young person is having a mental health issue or they are feeling stressed or stigmatized or marginalized or whatever it is, and they are going to turn to a drug, to a substance of any sort, and then they start using that substance, and then they don't want to tell their parents or any you know adult authority figures about it, those adult authority figures will never know what went into that. They won't even know those problems necessarily were existing that led their child or the youth in their care to pursue drug drug abuse, honestly, right? So like my parents, ADHD wasn't exactly a very commonly known thing when I was growing up, but I wasn't expressing to my parents what I was experiencing or why I was turning to different substances to try and self-medicate. So they never actually even knew. It was until I was an adult and went to my own therapist that they kind of nailed it immediately. Um, but yeah, so I think that communication and when, whenever you have a moral panic around substance use or any kind of behavior, you are functionally guaranteeing that youth pursue that behavior and don't tell their parents about it and hide that behavior, which is, if we're talking about youth and mental health, that's one of the worst things. When someone feels cut off and isolated and they cannot talk to the people in their lives that they trust to find the support that they need, uh, yet it's just, it's a cascade of really problematic um, things, just one on top of the other for youth. And that's a great point, Ellen.